What you do in secret changes who you are. Our world is the opposite of secret, right? Our world wants to show everything, post everything, comment on everything. Everybody's a celebrity and a model and the world's greatest parent and an activist and a reporter. See, God doesn't care about how many Instagram followers you have. He cares about what you do when nobody's looking. When I was a young man, an old man said something to me that transformed my life. And you have to hear what he said. It's had one of the biggest influences on my finances, on my relationships, on my health, and on my walk with God. And if you hear what he said to me today, I promise your life will be changed. Here's the story, it goes like this. I was a young guy, and we had this area across the street from my house. It was kind of a na nature preserve. There, there was a creek going through, there were animals. One time I saw a mountain lion, and he let me live. Thank you, I'm glad. <laughs> grateful. You ever seen a Presbyterian circumflex? <laughs> Thank you for that line, for letting me live. And I was just a young guy, and I used to love going over there all the time. Now, when I, in, in these days, I was a big fan of Karate Kid, of Jackie Chan movies, the old Bruce Lee movies. And one day, on the wild side, a little patch of yellow bamboo began to grow. Now, bamboo is not native to California, and back then in the early 80s, you didn't see it a lot. So when I saw it, I was excited. And of course, like Jackie Chan, I would kick it and punch it and like pretend I was in China or Hong Kong, and it just felt very cool. One day, I'm over on the wild side walking my dog, and I see that a local person from the city, a gardener of some type, has come and cut back all the bamboo, and all that was left was this little, the little nubs on the ground. And there was an old man there. I looked at the old man and he said, you seem sad about this. And I said, well, this was my little piece of Hong Kong, and it's gone forever. I can't believe they cut down the bamboo. I love the bamboo. He looked at me and he said, cut down, cut down. Young man, there is bamboo under us right now. And it's under the ground over there, and over there, and over there. That guy from the city just made the biggest mistake in gardening history. If you want to get rid of bamboo, you don't cut it down. If you cut down bamboo, all you've done is caused it to grow everywhere. And he said, I'll make you a promise. Bamboo will now be everywhere, all over here, and not long. And he was right. It wasn't long, and bamboo was everywhere. That old man, by the way, was my dad. <laughs> now, I was, uh, <laughs> he was old, too. He was pushing, like, 38, 39 <laughs> back then. Can't imagine. He was right. And what he taught me in that day was something that occurs in nature, it occurs in our body. It occurs in the universe all around us. It, occur, it occurs in all of God's creation. And here's the simple principle, is that there are certain things in life that when you only cut them back a little bit, you actually help them. He was teaching me in terms of fitness because he was teaching me how to build my muscles, you know? So we would weight lift in the garage. And so he said, you know, whenever you with lift weights, you can see it under a microscope, you'll see that the muscle's actually being damaged and stretched and the cells are being destroyed. But that's the only way to make a muscle bigger and make it stronger. It didn't make sense to me, but he said it's like bamboo. And here are the words that transformed my life. Here's the words that are gonna change your life. And this is important if you're starting over. This is important if you're starting fresh. Maybe you're just getting out of college and you're looking for a career. Maybe you just lost your job. Maybe you're going through a weird transition and you're starting over. Here are the words that I promise if you hold them in your heart, everything will be different. If you get these in your bones, everything will be different. Here's the words. Take care of the roots and everything else will take care of itself. Take care of the roots. Take care of what's under the surface. Take care of what people don't see. Take care of the thoughts, take care of your heart. Take care of the books, take care of what you listen to. Take care of the friendships. Take care of what's deep down inside. Take care of who you're becoming and everything else will take care of itself. 
everything else will take care of itself. Like bamboo. I believe that you are built a little more like bamboo and a little less like indoor plants. And so if you're starting today or if you're starting over, there's going to be four things we're going to talk about that are going to make a huge difference. And that is to plan, to plant, to tend, and to harvest. We'll get there. But first, before we get into these four things, we have to understand the power of secrecy or the power of things happening uh, in, the, in secret. It was interesting, many years ago when I was in seminary, I decided to memorize the Sermon on the Mount, which is sort of considered Jesus' pivotal speech on life. What I thought I was going to get after memorizing the Sermon on the Mount was a monk-like sense of zen and peace. I really thought this. I thought if I memorize the Sermon on the Mount, I'm just going to like sort of walk around and be this incredibly calming presence, like a massage, like I can massage people with my words and my, my vibe. That's not what happened. When I read the Sermon on the Mount, I was very surprised to find out that the biggest word that pops when you read that sermon is the word reward. Everyone say reward. Now, when you think of Jesus' speeches, you don't think of reward, but the word pops up over and over, and it's often linked to another word, secret. Here's what I learned. The biggest surprise of all is that Jesus is teaching us principles to get a reward. And the reward wasn't just going to heaven when I died. It was. In some cases, the reward was a financial reward. In some cases, the reward was a health reward. In some cases, the reward was a relational reward. And it, I started to understand that there is a reward when we do things the way he teaches us to do them. And that it's okay, actually, to do things with a motive for a reward. Then the second thing I noticed was in the Sermon on the Mount, that when you do things in secret, they have more power. It's not like we have to only do things in secret, but there is something special about doing something in secret. Let me ask you a question. If somebody says something nasty about you in private, but says something really nice to you to your face, which one feels more true to you? I'm going with secret on this one. We don't want to believe it. What happens in secret is what really is the truth. So there's two reasons why when we do things in secret that they become more powerful. The first is this. God's rewards are bigger than man's rewards. If you want a blessing in life, God can give it to you. And God sees what's done in secret. But here's the second reason. What happens in secret is what changes you. You want to be a new person? You want to be stronger? You want to change? Focus on what you're doing in secret. See, the greatest artists, the greatest musicians, the greatest athletes, the greatest whatever in life, they're known as the greats because of what we see them do in public. Now, if you think uh, this sermon is about money, you've missed the point. It's not about money. It's about rewards. Not just financial rewards, but all the rewards of life. This sermon is about life about how to have the biggest and best life, even if everything's been cut down. And here's the answer. You work on yourself. You focus on the roots. And maybe you're here today, and you've been cut down. Your life has been messed up. You've just lost a lawsuit, or you've been betrayed, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've lost your job. Maybe your business went bust, or your church collapsed or you lost someone super important, someone you love, someone you can't imagine living without. What an opportunity that before you now lies everything if you just do these four things. Here's the first thing. Begin with the end in mind. I think Franklin Covey said that. Begin with the end in mind. Don't start your day until you finish your day up here or on paper. Don't start your year until you have a plan for what you want to accomplish in the year. Start your life with the end of your life in mind, and your life will go better for you. Charlie Munger, the great investor from Berkshire Hathaway, used to teach this. He, he would teach young people, write your eulogy, write what you'd want people to say about you, write what you'd want them to say it was like being around you, or what you accomplished, or what you did, or what you experienced and reverse engineer and live that life. Whatever you do, if you write that eulogy or if you write that goal or if you write out the next phrase of your life, here's the biggest advice I can give you today. Make it big. Why not? Make it big. 
Make the dream big. Make it full of big. Make it full of big dreams. Make it full of big buildings. Make it full of big conversations. Make it full of big trips and big adventures. Make it full of big plates of food. Make it full of big celebrations, but make it big. I remember when I was sitting with my dad once, or my grandfather, years ago, and uh, he looked at me and he said, Bobby, let me ask you a question about your dreams and goals. Do they scare you? And I sat back for a minute. I said, you know what? They don't really scare me. I think I feel good about it. And he looked at me and says, that's the problem. <laughs> you ought to have a dream that scares you. You ought to have a dream that's so big it makes you a little bit nervous. Mario Andretti said something like this. He said, if it feels like everything is under control, you're not going fast enough. <laughs> big dreamers. Big dreamers make the difference. Uh, here's what I believe. Most dreams are not achieved simply because they are not big enough. That's the main reason. Wouldn't you say, well, shouldn't big dreams be less like? No! Here's why. Big dreams are more likely to come to pass for a couple of reasons. Number one, small dreams and big dreams require the same amount of work. See, big dreams make you more excited. They make you more excited. They don't just make you excited, they make everyone else excited. Big people are not attracted to small dreams. And you're going to need big people for your big dream. Big resources are not attracted to small dreams. Big dreams require you to have a bigger heart, more courage. Big dreams require you to have a bigger character. Big dreams require you to have a bigger mind. They require you to have a bigger outlook, to have a bigger everything. In other words, a bigger dream requires a bigger you. And that, in fact, is the point of it all. Is that in order to attain the dream, the thing that God has given to you, you have to become a bigger person. God likes big churches, but God loves big Christians. And that's what we hope to accomplish here. Amen? So the first thing is plan it out. Plan it out. Write it down. Write down the big dream. Get excited. Get pumped up about it. The second thing, you look at this burned field. You look at this empty lot. You look at your life. It just feels like a square space of dirt. Here's what you do. Sow some seeds. Sow some seeds. I remember when I was a kid, I said the lady's name in the first service, and Hannah said, you can't say her name on TV. So we're going to call her Miss Krakenbupel. <laughs> Miss Krakenbupel, in uh, seventh grade, was the meanest teacher ever. And uh, she was, uh, we called her the nun. She was a uh, Baptist, but she still had this nun, bad, evil nun vibe about her. And she'd go around you know, especially to the boys telling us how bad we were. And the thing she would always say is, you reap what you sow, you know? <laughs> and I remember just thinking about the way she said, you reap what you sow. Here's what she was referencing, Galatians. Chapter six, verse seven, it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to the please the flesh from the flesh, they will reap destruction. All right, there's the negative side, right? That's the part she's talking about, right? That's the part, and that's where they always stop, just the debit side of the ledger. But the cool thing about the Bible is there's a positive and negative. It always gets both sides of the ledger, right? The debits and the credits. Here's the positive side. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now, when you see the word eternal life in the Bible, don't think just heaven, and it is that. But think eternal living. It's something that's available now. It's what you think of when you say, I really want to live. This is what you're asking for. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In other words, yes, if you sow bad stuff, you're going to get bad results, right? We all know that. If you play stupid games, you're going to win stupid prizes. We know that, right? But here's the other side. If you plant good things, you're going to reap good things. And by the way, that's not the whole story. If you plant one kernel and wait a little while and take care of it and water it, you're not going to reap one more kernel. You don't just reap what you sow. 
you reap 30, 60, 100 times what you sow. You see what I'm saying? Wow. So begin to plant some seeds. Begin to plant some seeds. When I was at Oral Roberts, Oral Roberts taught us, if you have a need, plant a seed. Plant a seed. You can't just go up to some dirt and say, I need, I need, I need. What does the dirt say back to you? Plant some seed. Plant some seed. You've got to sow. You've got to sow if you want to reap. You can't reap what you don't sow. So sow. Sow into your relationships. They require a little bit of seed all the time. A father says, I don't need to sow into my daughter. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to work for 17 years, never talk to her. And on the 17th year, I'm going to quit my job and spend a whole year with her. And it'll be fine. Disaster. No, you can't do that. A man says, goes to the dentist, has cavities. The dentist says, you got to brush your teeth twice a day. Eat a little less sugar. A man says, I don't need to brush twice a day. Here's what I'll do. I'll just won't brush it all. And the last day of each month, I'll brush my teeth for two hours. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Somebody goes to the doctor. Doctor says, you need to get healthy. You need to lose some weight. Your heart's not looking very good. The person says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep eating the pizza and the burgers and the fries and the cakes. And then the last month of each year, I'm just not going to eat anything. Water only for a month. No, no. We all know this is ridiculous. That's not how you do it. You have to sew. Sow into your health. Sow into your relationships. We know that you've got to sow into your money. So many people today, they don't spend 100% of their money. They spend 110%. Right? Somebody says, oh, I don't need to worry. I'll just win the lottery. Or I'll fall down at Disneyland and win a lawsuit or something. No, you've got to sow and, and improve your value to the marketplace. You've got to put a little money aside. You've got to tithe so that God will bless you. And most of all, many of us, we think, I'll just pray a prayer before I die. I'll be like Constantine. I'll pray a prayer and I'll go to heaven. No. You want a full, rich life? Pray the prayers. Attend the services. Listen to the sermons. Go deeper into worship. Just seek God with all your heart. Sow the seeds. Okay, so number one, you got to plant. Number two, you got to sow some seeds. Number three, you got to tend to the, the crops in the summer. You've planted these seeds, they're starting to grow up. Your relationships are starting to get better. Your business is starting to grow. Your church is starting to increase in attendance. You're starting to do better. You're starting to make more. You're starting to achieve more. You're starting to accomplish more, but you're not quite there yet. And this is when the weeds and the pests come around and try to take your crop. You gotta tend to your crop. You gotta fight the weeds. You gotta defend your sheep from the wolves. They're coming, we all know it. And let me tell you, if you've ever been a gardener, it's very hard. I've, no, I've never succeeded as a gardener. And uh, unless I hired some help. And here's what I tell you, you're gonna need some help. There's an old African proverb, it goes like this. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, Go with friends. You're going to need some friends. You're going to need some help. You're going to need a team to achieve what God's put on your heart. And when you do that, you're going to have to delegate some things. But here's what Michael Gerber said. He wrote probably the best business book ever, The E-Myth. He said, delegate, don't abdicate. Now, this is a temptation when you get some help in your life to just say, it's their problem now. I'm paying them. Or to say, it's their problem now. They volunteered for it. No, no, that's abdication. That's giving up. You have to delegate. You have to cast a vision. You have to hold people accountable. You have to stay connected. Just because you're tired doesn't mean you abandon ship. Don't expect your pastor to pray for you. Expect him to pray with you. The prayer is yours. Don't expect the government to solve your problems. It's only going to su support you, hopefully. Don't expect your school to raise your children. You've got to raise them. Don't expect your doctor to make, your, make you healthy. You need to be healthy. You need to take care of yourself. And all these people and all these institutions and all of these friends and all of these teammates, they want to help you. They can help you. They will help you. But you have to be responsible for your life. Don't abdicate the responsibility. Delegate it. They will help you, but they cannot drive the ship for you.
It's your ship. It's your field. It's your life. No one cares about your life as much as you do. Nobody cares as much about your kids as you do. You have to tend to what is yours. Tend to what is yours. Nobody cares as much as you do. Bring friends along, but don't, don't abdicate. And finally, the season will come when you look upon the seeds that you sowed and protected and cared for, and you will see a big field of golden wheat ready to harvest. When that time comes, there isn't much time at all. It's time to go. Go, go, go. When the harvest time comes, go, go for it. Here's what Jesus said. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. What does that mean? Jesus sees something that the disciples can't see. There's a field of endless opportunity. Now, in his case, he's talking about preaching the gospel and winning people to heaven. But isn't it true that in general, in life, there is so much that's available to us that we're so blind to? There is so much in terms of health, so much in terms of experiences and conversations, so much that's available in terms of financial means, and especially in terms of eternal reward that's all around us. But so many of us can't see it. Why? Because we're city slickers. You see, who knows when a field is grass or a field is wheat? And who knows when that wheat is ready to be harvested or needs to be tended to? Who knows? And the answer is the farmer. See, when you get into it, when you begin to plant, when you begin to do the work, you get eyes to see when the time is ready. Farmers can tell when a field is ready. City slickers can't. Remember that old film, City Slickers? Speaking of films, one of the great films of all time, Schindler's List. There's this beautiful story, if you haven't seen the film, true story about a man named Oskar Schindler, who's a member of the Nazi party. And he was actually a bit of a huckster kind of early on. But he was somehow moved to save the Jews. And he had this factory. And so what he would do is he would use money he had to bribe and pull Jews that were being sent to concentration camps to work in his factory. And when they were brought to his factory, he was able to save them from being killed. And over his lifetime, he spent every dollar he had saving people. And I believe the amount was 1,600 Jews were saved from concentration camps. Wow. And at the end of the movie, the character, who's played by Liam Neeson, has this, he should have won an Oscar for it, amazing moment, where there's all of these people who he's seen saved. The, The war is over, and they're all standing there, and there are tears in their eyes, and they're thankful for Schindler. And then he notices his car and he thinks all the lives that could have been saved. He was given this gift and it's a ring and in Hebrew it says, anyone who saves one life saves the world. And he looks at his car and he says, this car, why did I keep this car? This could have been 10 lives. And he has a pin. He says, this pin, this could have been two lives. It's gold, maybe one, at least one for sure. And he just begins to weep. And I wonder if when we get to heaven, if we might not have a similar experience. When we get to heaven, there are gonna be some people that aren't there that we wish were. Or when we get to heaven, there's gonna be people there who we're grateful that they're there, but we hear their story of their suffering, of the times they were starving, of the times they were alone, of the times they weren't invited, the times where they weren't welcomed, the times when they were standing in the rain and nobody was there to help them. And we'll think, all the time I spent on this other stuff that's not important. I couldn't see that the harvest was ripe, that the fields were golden and ready for someone with me. If only I had eyes to see. I ask you, my friend, open your eyes and see what's available. When the harvest time is ready, go for it. Go for what's available to you. Finally, I'll just say one more thing. Sometimes you do everything right. Sometimes you plan, sometimes you sow. Sometimes the harvest is ready and you get out there to get the harvest and everything gets wiped out. Maybe this is true with your kids or your grandkids. Maybe this is true with your business. I know a guy who had amazing business and during COVID, COVID just wiped him out. No no way he could have predicted that. What do you do when everything gets wiped out? You have a choice. Will you sow again? Will you plan again? Will you dream again? Will you go for it again? There's no better way to live your life. 
and to become all you can become, to do all you can do, to touch as many lives as you can touch. I want to encourage you to do that. And finally, I want to encourage you to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. I, I ask that every single time because it's the most important thing. What does it matter if you leave here and you're not at peace with God? I want to encourage you, my friend, to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He laid his life down on the cross for you that you could be saved. I want to encourage you to invite him into your heart and you'll be saved. And if you do that, text me the word hope to the number on the screen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that so much is available to all of us. Help us to focus on all that we can become so that we can attract the things into our life as we develop as people. In short, help us to be disciples. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Thank you for watching Hour of Power on YouTube. We hope this message encourages you. Like and subscribe below for more encouraging content.